Fat tissue can make its own cortisol, but it's not cortisol made from the adrenal glands, it's cortisol made within the fat tissue. And so the cortisol gets amplified right in the fat tissue itself. And of course, cortisol effect on fat tissue is to make more fat tissue. Corticosteroids either injected, um, oral, topical, inhaled, or uh, intranasal. So these are your prednisones, your allergy medications that are, you know, like Flonase and stuff. These are your inhalers for allergies and asthma. Um, these, the cordate creams because you've gotten a poison IV or you've got some crazy rash on your arm or leg. So the longer those are used and the stronger the dose, the more suppressive they are to the adrenals and can induce full adrenal insufficiency. And what's interesting is that even after stopping it for six months, that a significant amount of users still had adrenal insufficiency. Hello and welcome back to another episode of High Intensity Health Radio. Thanks for tuning in and subscribing. I'm your host, Mike Munsell, and today we're gonna to talk about adrenal fatigue with Dr. Carrie Jones, and she's gonna really tell you, does adrenal fatigue really exist in some different lifestyle choices, medications that may or may not affect adrenal health, and ways that the adrenal glands can affect hormone production, particularly in women, but also in men. And so we're gonna talk about hair loss for both men and women. We're gonna talk about belly fat and how belly fat can produce its own cortisol. Uh, we're gonna talk about different uh, topical steroid creams and even anti-allergy asthma medications and Accutane and how that can affect the adrenal. So really important stuff and she's a perfect person to talk about this. I've known her since 2011 and when I first met her, she was just a complex thinker. I knew right away she thought deep. And so today we really took a deep dive into adrenals, adrenal fatigue, and really defined like does adrenal fatigue exist? And I think you're gonna be surprised at her answer. So I hope you enjoy this episode. And again, if you're listening to this in iTunes, thanks for tuning in and thanks for subscribing. If you're watching over on YouTube, hello and thanks for tuning in. Please subscribe to the channel as well because this is where we launch new updates. And I wanna let you know again, before we start about the Autism Intensive, a great online summit. I have the trailer ready, so you check out that at theautismintensive.com. Wonderful interviews, Dr. Ben Lynch, Sid Baker, Jeff Bland. I mean, there's a whole list of amazing people that I think you'll really enjoy learning from. So even if you have older children or you're not affected by a child with autism, ADD, ADHD, I think you'll really benefit from the info because we really took a deep dive into dietary strategies, environmental toxins, uh, ways to improve gut health and, and restore immune tolerance so folks with autoimmunity and allergies and atopy can benefit from that as well. Again, the URL is called theautismintensive.com. You can also find that by watching the show notes below this video or on the show notes that I posted for Dr. Kerry Jones. Of course, this is episode number 122 at uh, highintensityhealth.com slash drjones. So with that, let's dive into the interview with Dr. Kerry Jones. So excited today to be with Dr. Kerry Jones. And when we first met a couple years ago, Dr. Jones, I was writing the book, Belly Fat Effect. And I yeah. remember sitting there talking and we were talking about leptin and T-regulatory cells. And most NDs and even MDs that I meet with are like, yeah, leptin, T-reg cells. And you were like really excited and I geeked remember, out. Yeah, I remember. So, <laughs> so I know you have a complex, you know, broad a systems thinking or way of looking at, at mm -hmm. uh, complex systems. And so... I wanted to pick your brain on adrenal fatigue and talk about what that is, does it really exist, and how do we assess it, and, and so forth. So let's just, can you launch with what is adrenal fatigue? Adrenal fatigue, I always put it in quotes, adrenal fatigue, right? Because everybody talks about, they've done, this, the, they've done the online surveys, they've read the book, they're, they're very tired, they've been diagnosed, oh, I have adrenal fatigue, I'm really tired, my adrenals are given out. And the thing is, um, the concept of adrenal fatigue, I think, is really starting to become outdated because the adrenals are not meant to give out. The ovaries are meant to give out and shut down, but the adrenals are not meant to do so. And so it's a response. The hypothalamus tells the pituitary what to do. The pituitary tells the, ov the ovary, the adrenal, and then the adrenals make cortisol. And so it's really a communication issue. It really often more stands behind the hypothalamus and pituitary and not as much on the adrenal. So I'm not saying people aren't tired. I'm not saying maybe the adrenal isn't responding like it's supposed to, or the pituitary is not telling the adrenal to do like it's supposed to. But the concept that the adrenal is tired, closed its doors, isn't gonna make cortisol anymore, shut down, is I think is false. It doesn't exist, I right? don't think it really exists, so no. The, so to infer what you're saying, so the messages, the communication messages from the brain to the adrenals may be dysfunctional from factors that we make it into, like inflammation, poor right. diet, you know, exactly. leaky gut. Exactly. But it's not like the adrenal glands just say, all right, 
we're retiring. Yeah, peace out. We're going through a mental <laughs> adrenal pause. Adrenal pause, exactly. I'm not yeah. doing this anymore. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, yeah because it's we hear that a lot, and mm -hmm. and I, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been you know through naturopathic medical school, very fatigued and tired, and so yes. you hit the glandulars and you hit things, and and that doesn't really seem that may sh offer a short-term fix for some people, but right. it doesn't really get at the the you know the, the root cause. So what are some factors that are tugging and pulling on the communication pathways from the brain to the adrenals that you want to share? Well, I'd say the, the big, big ones nowadays, of course, is just stress, the long-term chronic stress. And so people do glandulars and they do herbals and they do all these vitamins, just like you said, really great in the short term. But if you're not addressing the reason you got fatigued in the first place, then you're just going to keep digging yourself into a hole. So stress is the big one. And the thing is, when you're looking at adrenal health, you want to look at how much the gland is producing versus how much is free and available. These are two different numbers and two different factors you have to look at. So things like stress, things like inflammation, things like obesity, because adipose tissue creates its own inflammatory cytokines. Adipose tissue creates um, or upregulates the enzyme 11 beta HSD, which I'm sure we'll talk about, mm -hmm. that converts cortisone into cortisol and um, hyperthyroid or taking too much thyroid medication. A lot of people over medicate themselves on thyroid or they keep thinking every time I raise my thyroid medication, I feel better. It's like, well, no, you don't feel better. You just press the gas down on the adrenals. You for, uh, stimulate the thyroid. You've got all this thyroid hormone and, and then you burn yourself out again. And so all those things will greatly affect the way that your adrenals do or do not work. Just like hypothyroid, hypothyroid will slow the adrenal way, way down. Interesting. So it's we just have quite a balance. Yeah, so it's all, it's all a network. And so that's yes. why just taking a glandular to work on the adrenals may not fix the network, which is right. the, the problem. Right. That's awesome. Exactly. So let's talk about this network in, in a sense of, the, the other you know, organs and tissues in the body that can increase or, or can make their own cortisol, the liver and the fat cells. Yes. I think that's really fascinating. Yes. So what happens is the adrenals make cortisol first and then it can convert it into cortisone, which is inactive. Now cortisone is different than like people who say, oh, I got a cortisone shot. Cortisone and a cortisone shot, cortisone in the body and a cortisone shot are very different. So cortisone is really cortisol, the shot. Cortisone is the inactive form of cortisol. It's dead, inert, so to speak. But they can convert back and forth to each other. So when the body wants to slow down, when you're really stressed out, or if you've been ill, then you will make more cortisone. It's a built-in mechanism to say, hey, let's heal. So I'm going to make you really tired, so you'll slow down and rest and not push yourself. As humans, we never do that. Mm, <laughs> we right. just keep pushing. Um, on the flip side, if we're trying to be anti-inflammatory, um, or if the body is trying to give us some more oomph to recover, then it will make more cortisol. The problem is certain tissues will do it more than others, like adipose tissue, fat tissue. And so you hear on the commercials all the time, you see the ads where they talk about the abdominal weight gain and how it's high cortisol. And it truly is. Ad fat tissue can make its own cortisol. It will take that cortisone and reactivate it into cortisol, cortisol regardless of the adrenals. Oh, it's amazing. It's so not fair. <laughs> right, right. And so let's talk about this cortisol production. And so some of the research that we were sharing, you know, before this interview mm -hmm. from Rainer Straub and others show that the extra adrenal, so the, the extra adrenal tissues such as the uh, liver and adipose tissue, mm -hmm. when they're making this cortisol, then that will have suppressive effects on the brain to adrenal axis so that, so right. that the brain will say, oh, there's enough cortisol. We don't, the adrenals don't need to release it. And then that can maybe mimic signs of adrenal fatigue. Do you want to dive into it that? It can. It can because if if you um, the, like I, like you were saying, so the fat tissue can make its own cortisol, but it's not cortisol made from the adrenal glands. It's cortisol made within the fat tissue, and so the cortisol gets amplified right in the fat tissue itself. And of course, cortisol effect on fat tissue is to make more fat tissue, which is different than cortisol made from the adrenals because the hypothalamus is telling the pituitary to tell the adrenals to make cortisol or not or or not to make like hey feedback, let's not do this, we don't want to do this right now, slow mm. that cortisol production. That's important also to, to discuss because the, the brain to adrenal connection, as I understand it, oscillates in a circadian rhythm. Yes. So that's yes. going to be a pulsatile you know, release and so the adrenal gland should fire cortisol in the morning to get us out of bed and to fire us up. But if yep. the fat cells are inflamed and on fire and there's excess adipose tissue, they may be cranking out cortisol all the time and so yes. people may feel yep. overly anxious and insulin resistant. Do you want to talk yep. about? Absolutely. Um, 
anxiety is a great one because the norepinephrine to epinephrine conversion happens in the adrenals and epinephrine is of course adrenaline and it's driven by cortisol. So mm. these people who have a whole lot of cortisol report being really anxious or jittery or they can't sleep, they're tired but wired, tired but stressed. They probably have a whole lot of um, adrenaline floating around because of all that excess cortisol that they've produced. Now the other thing too, you mentioned the rhythm. Um, what can happen is that you're supposed to right you like you said high in the morning low at night but people can make cortisol just have a rhythm issue so maybe they don't make any in the morning maybe they don't have that normal awakening response so they wake up tired they wake up drained they wake up you know dead until they get their caffeine <laughs> and mm. to get them going and then they maybe they flatline through the day or maybe you know once they get going after a couple hours then the response kicks in and they do make some cortisol it's inappropriate it's it's the wrong pattern to be in or maybe they're low during the day and then they're high at night now they can't sleep so they they get their second wind they're all ready to go um their but their mind is racing you know they can't fall asleep, they can't stay asleep, then they can't make melatonin, then they can't make growth hormone, now they can't repair their cells, and it just becomes this downward spiral. Right, can't detox and do all that. So, yes. so how much of that do you think the, we can maybe classify this, put it into a bucket of circadian rhythm imbalance, right? Yeah. From like artificial light, staying up late, like partying on the weekends yes. and then going to bed at eight. Phones. It's Phone. that I see it all the time. I was talking to a doctor, um, he was treating, treating hockey players. Hockey players are young. They have a ton of testosterone, they have a ton of fans, you know, they like to fight. And I'm looking at the adrenal glands and the adrenal, the cortisol is really, really, or excuse me, really, really low at night. And the doctor said, why is his cortisol so low? I said, because he's on his phone all night. Mm. You know, he's, he's out late, he's, he's celebrating, he's partying, and then he comes home and he's immediately on his phone. So now he has, su he's suppressing him, all this bright light, and then he's blue light from the phone and he's just killing his adrenals. Right, so his brain is saying, oh, it's daytime, we got to crank out right. cortisol, and then so the rhythm gets right. all unbalanced over yes. time. Yes, yes, and then um, all that extra cortisol, the pineal gland is like, well, if you're going to be in the daylight, I'm not going to make melatonin, mm. and so it just gets all messed up. Gosh, yeah, that's a really important point. People forget about the phones, and everyone's on Instagram, yes. Snapchat, Facebook, uh, all these yes. things, right? Yes. So, yeah, or dating websites, <laughs> right. Tinder, right? They're flipping through <laughs> Tinder at midnight when they shouldn't be. Right, right. And then the cortisol comes up, and the melatonin goes down, and they can't figure out why they can't sleep, or why they can't heal, or why they can't recover from their workout, or why they can't lose weight, why yeah. they have anxiety. That's a really great point. I'm, I'm glad you're reinforcing that. So they make these UVX glasses that yes. you can buy for like $4.99. I think they're on Amazon. Yeah. Do you recommend that or just ditching the phone? Like what are your Ditch best? Ditch the phone. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the glasses work great. And I know there are some apps, I think, that will change the tint of your um, phone. So that it be, it's not as stimulating, but... Yo, ditch the phone. Yeah, or at least it's hold it far away if you yes. have to use it. That's or what I do. And bring the brightness down. That's what I tell people all the yeah. time. Bring the brightness down, you know. And same with the lights in the room, you know, before bed as you're winding down, bring the brightness down. Yeah, I love where this conversation is going because we got a little complex there, but then brought it back down to just the practical tips. And yeah. people ask me all the time, I'm doing everything right. I'm eating right, I'm exercising mm -hmm. right, and this. And then you forget about these small little things like environmental toxins in your bed or yes. your couch or yep. the phone, the EMF and affecting circadian rhythms. Yes because leptin and insulin, all these you know, hormones, testosterone, oscillate on a circadian rhythm. So yep. it's not just the adrenals that are being affected here. It's everything. Um, so let's tie that back in. Now, we talked about liver health and how the fat cells have this enzyme, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase right. type one. It's a complex <laughs> one, right? So the liver HSD. also has this guy. Do you want to talk about the liver's role in cortisone and cortisol production? Sir, sure. so when, like I said, when the adrenal gland makes cortisol, the kidneys can deactivate the cortisol into cortisone. So before it gets flushed out the body, the kidneys go, whoop, flips to cortisone, out it goes. Whereas as it's circulating, if the body is converting it to cortisone, then um, the liver can reactivate it into cortisol, just like the fat cells can. So it's this nice balance back and forth and a healthy, normal human being, you know, certain glands turn it off, certain glands turn it on. It depends. Do you need energy at the moment? Or do you need anti-inflammatory? Or do you need to calm down and heal? And so like I said, in a healthy person, it should be a nice ebb and flow back and forth. I see. Does it always happen? Absolutely not. If your liver's toxic, you know, if you've got a lot of exposure, um, if you're drinking a lot, uh, blood sugar, insulin issues, high cholesterol, triglycerides, you're not going to have the healthiest liver, therefore you're probably not going to have the healthiest cortisone, cortisol shuttle. 
Right, right. That's important because we, we're seeing non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, fatty yes, liver yes. from too much dietary carbohydrates and sugar causing lipid deposition in the liver. So yes. liver health is important for yes. general health. So that's yep, what, absolutely. For everything, right? Hormone, hormone processing. Yep. Anything processing. <laughs> As an ND, I mean, you specialize in hormones for quite a while. Do you mm -hmm. recommend people just, you know, like uh, prophylactically take milk thistle and choline and things for the I liver? I do, or? absolutely. Even simple stuff, because people will go, oh, I can't remember to take pills. I'm like, we'll drink detox tea. I mean, it sounds goofy, but you know, like every little bit helps. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you can do, do, you know, have your greens, you know, make your smoothie with the healthy stuff, eat right. artichokes and take choline if you can. And yeah, milk thistle is so protective for the cells themselves that I think we need it. In this day and age, it's unfortunate we need it. Yeah, yeah, it's, we're, I mean, we're probably, t you know, causing toxicity in this, you know, home right here, just talking right now, which is really <laughs> uh, unfortunate. But so, so let's um, get into caffeine. You talked about caffeine, like how, because we hear this all the time, like if yes. you have adrenal fatigue or whatever, don't drink caffeine or coffee. So yes. what's your take? Oh gosh. Um, it's hard because I'm not a coffee drinker. I've never, ever been a coffee drinker. Um, I live in the Northwest and don't drink coffee. It's like blasphemy. But I do drink green tea, and I drink green tea every day. And so I have this, it's hard for me to say, oh, caffeine is really, really bad for the adrenals because I myself am drinking caffeinated green tea mm -hmm. every day. But I think there is a point when people rely on caffeine to get going and th subsequently drink a lot of caffeine, whether it's soda, whether it's coffee, whether it's five hour energies, whether it's the energy drinks, you know, all these, I think then it becomes like whipping a dead horse. You know, you've got to go back to why do you need all that caffeine in the first place? If you're just having a cup of coffee because you like the smell, you like the taste, it's like your morning routine. You have like me, you do some caffeinated green tea um, or Earl Grey or something. That's, I think, different than the person who's dependent on it because they're, they burn themselves out so much. The communication from the brain down is like, please, slow down, please stop, please take care of yourself. And we don't, our society just doesn't do it. Yeah. And so I think caffeine, you know, there's a, there's a stand, there's sort of a, a continuum of like a healthy amount versus you've, you've ruined yourself and now you're so dependent on caffeine. Now you're whipping a dead horse. Mm, so okay. I have a hard time saying no caffeine, but like, let's go back to the cause in the first place. Right, so if you can't get out of bed without coffee, then that's yes. a problem. But if you yes. just enjoy your morning routine of a cup of coffee in the newspaper. Probably fine. Okay. Yep, probably fine. Uh, what about yes. alcohol? Alcohol, alcohol is a really interesting one. One, because they say any more than two glasses of alcohol will raise estrogen, and it's because of the effect on the liver. Alcohol has a lot of, um, a lot of it has a lot of sugar and carbohydrates, raises insulin, and can really be um, detrimental to the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and then of course the adrenals. Now, the occasional glass of alcohol, you know, no big deal, but if somebody's, drinking two glasses of wine every night to, un to unwind when they get home from work, probably a problem. Mm -hmm. And probably a bigger problem because they're relying on the red wine to relax them and calm them down. And so you know they have other stuff going on. You know they have neurotransmitter imbalance, you know they have adrenal imbalance, you know they've got all sorts of stuff and they're using the wine to calm it down. Right, and they justify so. it by saying, well, I heard a study that said two glasses of wine is great for heart health, so, <laughs> <laughs> so three is probably good as well, right? Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty right. funny. Interestingly, though, so I do heart math, which is yes. a similar way to, to look at parasympathetic, sympathetic ratio, and after having three glasses of wine, this was on vacation, it was really easy to get into that parasympathetic state. I yeah, was, oh, yeah. I was really kidding? surprised, yeah. so there's some, you know, physiologic uh, effects there, which is pretty interesting. Absolutely. And again, like I'm saying, I'm not saying, you know, no, don't drink ever. Yeah. You know, the occasional is fine. Vacation, you know, celebration. But, um, you know, once it's your thing, once it's kind of like coffee, once it's your crux, then becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. Yeah. yeah great point. Yeah. So we're going to get into sex hormones, but I think we got to finish off uh, the adrenal and, yeah. uh, and cortisol and things with some different yeah. medications. And I was really profound to hear you talk about asthma medications, I think, mm -hmm. and then uh, over the counter, uh, you know, uh, steroid based uh, cortisone and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Uh, there's, um, there's a great research study. Well, there's a couple, but um, corticosteroids either injected 
um, oral, topical, inhaled, or uh, intranasal. So these are your prednisones, your allergy medications that are, you know, like Flonase and stuff. These are your inhalers for allergies and asthma. Um, these, the cordate creams because you've gotten a poison IV or you've got some crazy rash on your arm or leg. So the longer those are used and the stronger the dose, the more suppressive they are to the adrenals and can induce full adrenal insufficiency. And what's interesting is that um, they said even after six months, even after stopping it for six months, that a significant amount of users still had adrenal insufficiency. Wow. So it can take, so people will ask me like, well, I've done, I do, you know, allergy medication. Um, I don't mean the antihistamines, I mean the ones that truly have steroids in them. You know, they'll say, oh, I stopped it a while ago. Why am I still tired? I'm like, well, it can take six months or more. And it depends how long you use them. If, if you're a regular asthma person who uses their inhaler every day and you have since you were a kid, it's going to take a long time for your adrenals to bounce back from that Yeah. versus just, oh, I needed it yesterday mm. and that was it. Right, right. Yeah. And the folks that have been on like prednisone for autoimmune disease, I know for yes. IBS and Crohn's and psoriasis, yes. what, what about those yes. folks? I, I see it on testing. I see it really suppressed. Often it gets misdiagnosed um, or not diagnosed, but missed like, oh my gosh, it must be Addison's. You must have Addison's. Mm. And maybe because they have autoimmune, autoimmunes tend to run together and Addison is an autoimmune, but really I'm like, they're taking 20 milligrams of prednisone every day and have for five years. Yeah. It's a feedback. The adrenals are like, I'm out. <laughs> right, right. You're on prednisone, do your thing. So how do you restore that communication system? Any tips? Well, it's really hard when they're on it, but if, they're, if they choose to go off um, or have managed to get themselves off, then I do a lot of um, sort of what we talked about with rhythm. So getting up in the morning, a lot of light exposure, getting those happy lights or the, you know, the good, the bright light in the morning, not being on their phone in, at night, dim lights at night, just trying to reset the circadian rhythm. Um, I do melatonin at night if I need it. I do, um, there's certain herbs that help a lot with communication. So mm -hmm. maca is a good one. Um, which is a Peruvian herb, and then cordyceps is another good one. I will use glandulars. I'll use hypothalamic or pituitary or adrenal glandulars kind of as needed to get them back. And then, you know, rest. You can't, you can't whip a dead horse. So mm, right. if their adrenals are, are, are down and trying to build themselves up, I tell people, don't go and use that energy. If I give you energy, don't go and use it. Put it in the energy bank. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Save up. Yeah, it's amazing the power of rest and vacation. And yes, yeah. yes. Which we, we just learned at the last conference that yeah, we were ben both Lynch. at. Yeah, <laughs> Ben Lynch, you know, he said, go walk, go on the beach and walk barefoot. And I was like, okay, doctor's orders. <laughs> right, pretty powerful. Yeah, it's amazing. That we're, this is what we're talking about, avoiding your cell phone, go on vacation. I mean, yeah. 50 years ago, doctors would listen to this and be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, this is what we're learning in 2015. <laughs> yeah, it, right. <laughs> but exactly. it's very applicable and it's really interesting. Exactly. Um, I want to talk before we get into rest and uh, you know looking at catabolism. I know that's a, a, a mm -hmm. way you can assess that. I, I'm going to forget about Accutane, and I think it's Accutane. really important. Yes. So um, Accutane. Interestingly, I just learned Accutane can suppress um, a lot of the hormone production, so it'll lower like LH. So you'll have low progesterone. It can lower t low testosterone in men, um, but it will also lower ACTH, which is what stimulates cortisol production. But they think the mechanism behind it is it induces permanent apoptosis, which is death of the cells in the hypothalamus and specifically also in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, of course, is where our short term memory is. And so and it's permanent apoptosis, permanent death. And I thought this is allowed. And sometimes people will do two or three rounds. I mean, some people unfortunately really have poor, bad acne and, and that's the only thing that works. And then they do it again and then they do it again and down the way. Maybe they have fertility problems, maybe they have growth problems, maybe they have a lot of adrenal issues, they're super fatigued. Um, it's really, it could be really bad. Yeah, the, the hippocampus and hypothalamus are two, I consider, you know, major, you know. Oh, yeah. Parts of the brain that you yeah. definitely don't want to induce permanent apoptosis. That sounds a little scary. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. To have your short-term memory, you know, to yeah. be ruined. I mean, Your it's master just, hormone center, yeah. I don't know. And think, if you think about it, Accutane is often done younger, right? It's teenagers, usually teenagers in early 20s, right, when all of that is getting developed and they're laying down their patterns and they're getting into their habits and now you've just potentially ruined it and it's kind of permanent ruin. Yeah. And so now you're working against that the rest of your life. Wow. But may not even realize it. Right. Right. Scary stuff. Right. They may think good. that something is wrong with them or they're born, have a right. defect when in, right. when in reality it's drug right. induced, which is really scary. Right. So thanks for sharing that info. Now let's yeah. get into anabolism and catabolism. A lot of research yes. is showing that. Yes. So, um, 
Anabolic is when a building, so anabolic are the people who build lean muscle, um, proteins, uh, they favor the testosterone and DHEA. Catabolic is more the breakdown. They break down their muscle, they break down blood sugar, they break down to fructose. These are the cortisol driven people. And so when I'm looking at a lot of uh, testing, I can see if their metabolized cortisol is higher than their total DHEA, I'm like, wow, they're in a massive catabolic state. And these are the people who often have weight loss issues, um, anxiety issues, blood sugar issues, insulin sensitivity. Um, they can't build lean muscle mass. They have poor recovery after workouts. Those are your catabolic folks. And it's all cortisol, often all cortisol driven. Right, so their metabolism is working, but it's breaking down the wrong stuff. Yes, exactly. <laughs> breaking down muscle exactly. at the expense of fat, yes, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Interesting. Exactly. So we'll, we'll get in now. Dr. Jones, it's really interesting because a lot of the research shows that how important of muscle is and muscle tissue, not just for bodybuilding, but, but like insulin sensitivity and diabetes. Yep. And I'll just share a quick you know, side note here. I was reading through some research and research actually showed that diabetes starts in the skeletal muscle of the legs is really interesting so huh. we're like breaking down yeah so it's uh, you know if, um, evidently and I did not know this but the muscle tissue in the upper body rarely becomes insulin resistant and mm. so it, it looks at like majority of our you know lower body muscle you know in our legs and so forth mm -hmm. it, it, like on a weight basis is generally unless someone's a bodybuilder more so than the upper body mm -hmm. and so it's really important I just wanted to kind of highlight this the importance of muscle tissue because that's where you burn fat that's where leptin latches onto that's where mm -hmm. insulin latches onto so mm -hmm. we want to protect this so tell us a little bit of more detail as to how you can evaluate this clinically and, and so people can you know go to their doctor or, or practitioners are looking at they want to look at this anabolism to catabolism ratio how are they doing that right so um, for the the lab test that I run and with a company I work for we do metabolized cortisol which is kind of similar to total cortisol output as opposed to free cortisol so it's how much cortisol is being made if that person has a lot of free or excuse me a lot of metabolized cortisol it's very high compared to their androgen markers, DHEA, testosterone, then I know they're very catabolic. And so um, the way the test is done is on a gauge. And so, you know, the cortisol gauge will be dialed way up and the DHEA gauge is dialed way down. And I'm like, it's like, it's a no brainer. I'm like, there it is. Look, you're catabolic. That's a problem. And just as you said, with muscle, people will say, well, how do I switch the other way? And I said, it's, it's weightlifting, it's interval training, it's, um, you know, not doing long cardio. I'm not saying don't do any cardio, but the people who say, well, I walk, I get on the elliptical and I'm like, no, that's not gonna, you know, I do the same pace for 30 minutes. I mm. go around my neighborhood for 30, I'm like, mm -mm. I need, you need to get some lean muscle on you. That's what helps push it. So if I heard you correctly, we can drive this pathway to mm -hmm. favor anabolism by just like increasing demand through strength and resistance training. Part One of, of the it? big ways. Yep. Okay. That's what I tell people. That mm -hmm. is so cool. Yep. That's fantastic. So once I'm looking on the lab, like, oh, yep, their me metabolized cortisol is way high. Clearly they're catabolic. And often the story fits. Often that they have problems losing weight. Um, maybe their blood sugars up in the upper 90s, lower 100s. Um, their hemoglobin A1C is not that good. Maybe their insulin is starting to get up there. And I'm like, yeah, they're, or they tell me I have a, I can't make very, I'm not making lean muscle. I have a tough time after workouts. I'm very, very tired. I'm like, hmm, looks like you're catabolic. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> so I, I do hear that, particularly coming from women, you know, that yes. conversation, I do some online, yes. like weight loss coaching and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, I think a lot of women want to go, go in and get testosterone. You know, that, that's what mm -hmm. they hear is, I'm going to meet with a bioidentical hormone doctor and get on mm -hmm. testosterone. So what would be, obviously testing would be your advice, but, it, but is jumping on testosterone the right route? Or um, You know, it depends on the person. It's it definitely helpful, but if you don't use it, then, you know, if you're not using the testosterone to help you build lean muscle, then it may not get you the benefits that you want, and then you've just spent a bunch of money unhappy, you know, with the results. Mm -hmm. So what I tell women is start with the weightlifting. Start with resistance training. Start with um, interval training, mm. and or, or if you maybe they have injuries, so like well, walking's what I can do. I'm like, well, then walk at an incline, or you know, vary your pace. Do you, tabata training. Do something for a minute. Do something for 30 seconds. Really change up that heart rate and get it going like that. That's awesome. So start there. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, a, a male friend who was 41, you know, had the symptoms, you know, belly fat, kind of mm -hmm. metabolic syndrome and jumped mm -hmm. on testosterone because he had low libido, couldn't put on muscle mm -hmm. and it didn't work for him. It kept upping the dose and nothing worked and, mm -hmm. it, and 
you know, we learn about this enzyme called aromatase. Do you want to talk about yes. what that does? Yes. So aromatase, aromat <laughs> aromatase is what takes testosterone and converts it into estrogen, especially in fat tissue. So it's called aromatization. And in men, when men over aromatize, they make way too much estrogen. And so they get that abdominal weight gain. They'll get the breast development. So they'll get moobs. Um, they often get very moody, more along sort of the crying, weepy, um, type mood swings as opposed to angry and mad. They're very, very tired. They lose all their testosterone, normal sort of function. So their libido goes down, their erections go down. Um, they're just not happy. And they have all, because they have all this extra estrogen and it's driven up by blood sugar, insulin and inflammation. And so those are men go on testosterone, but never fix the problem. Mm -hmm. And so they just keep making, they just go on testosterone and make ex all this extra estrogen. So they keep gaining weight, they keep getting pectoral development and they still have all these mood swings and fatigue and can't figure it out. Right, right. And so. And so doctors not doing expanded metabolite testing may right. just keep bumping up the testosterone. Right, because you know they run, they run the test and they're like, well, your testosterone's low, that must be the problem. I'm like, well, it is, but why? What, yeah. wh what's going on there? And in that case, your client's case, yeah, they were just making way too much estrogen. And there's, the great thing is there's stuff you can do to help. I mean, from a dietary point of view, you know, get your sugar and insulin under control, get your, your inflammation under control, stop eating the things that, you're, that are inflaming to you, stop doing the things in your lifestyle that are inflaming to you, and then go from there. There's some great herbals that can be helpful. And naturally there's a medication, but it has a lot of side effects. <laughs> right, <laughs> the aromatase inhibitors, mm -hmm. you mean? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I, I want to finish off with sex hormones, so I'm not avoiding all that, because we're going to get into, into all that, but uh, female pattern baldness. I yeah. see this so much more. It's like mm -hmm. everywhere I go, I see women, uh, not everywhere, but a lot of thinning hair, and I know mm -hmm. it has a huge impact on self-esteem and stuff like that. So is that DHT related? Uh, or it can be, absolutely. Okay. So I say um, hair loss, there's a couple of things. Um, stress, immediate stress will poof, lose hair. Um, low iron, will, a woman will lose hair. And then high cortisol, a woman will lose hair. And then if they're um, DHT, which is the it, it, testosterone converts into DHT along the 5-alpha reductase, that's the enzyme that does it. And so if somebody's very alpha dominant, then they're more prone to hair loss, hair thinning on their head. And unfortunately, the hair moves south. They also get facial hair. So they get, you know, they're like, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. And then it's missing up here. And so, yeah, if you're not testing for it, you may not know. And it may not show up as testosterone. You know, it may not show up as DHEA. You actually af actually test for DHT. You have to test for the 5-alpha metabolites and see if they're elevated. Right. So uh, can you explain that? I know there's different two different types of DHT metabolites, and one causes hair loss, one doesn't. Is yeah, so, they, so there's with D, DHEA, the andro, there's one called androsterone um, is the one that is the more alpha side that can cause the hair loss. And then the 5-alpha DHT, just the alpha side of the DHT, is the one that causes all the hair loss as well. I see. So okay. And so you can see that in the metabolite, like the yes, Dutch test, for yes, example. Yep. That's awesome yep. for people to, to understand. Kind of yep. what is the root cause of the hair loss? Exactly. Yeah. Or I can warn them. I can, I can look at the test and I can say, hey, if you don't have hair loss now, but you're going to go on DHEA or testosterone, there's a chance you're going to get it. And here's why. These things are upregulated and um, we need to do some things to combat it. Interesting. Or be so on the lookout for it. You can look at the genetic predisposition basically by looking at the metabolites yep. in a sense? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Or sometimes I don't even realize it. I'll tell them like, oh, are you having angry mood swings? Are you having facial hair? Are you having hair loss in your head? And they're like, yeah, how'd you know that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like right there. <laughs> right. I found it. That's mm -hmm. powerful stuff. And another metabolite, uh, unrelated to testosterone, but related to estrogen, is the 4-hydroxy and the 2-hydroxy. Mm -hmm. Can and you break 16. that down for us? It's really important for breast cancer prevention, I think people Ab should know about. Absolutely. So estrogen, when estrogen is done in the body, it goes through the liver and it goes through phase 1 detoxification. And with phase 1 detoxification, it gets broken down into one of three things, 2-hydroxy, 4-hydroxy, or 16-hydroxy. And so the two is the one that is the, the healthiest, whereas the four, the four hydroxy is the one that's the most potentially cancer causing. And the reason for that is when the body makes the four hydroxy, it has the highest risk for damage to the DNA. So there's pieces of the DNA that can break off. They're called depurinating addicts. And when they break off, the body goes, oh no, there's holes in my DHEA, or DHEA. There's holes in my DNA, fix it. But sometimes the fix is too fast and they mess up and then all of a sudden you have a mutation and now you have breast cancer. 
or uterine cancer or cervical cancer and so any of those estrogen dominant and if they doesn't get all the way to phase two detox and get methylated which sort of neutralizes it then they're at really big risk for developing cancer for due developing to cancer. dna damage yes yeah it's really interesting yes. to think about that our own hormones that are higher in women than men can actually cause cancer in a sense because they mm -hmm. damage dna that's such mm -hmm. a when i read that from eleanor rogan at university mm -hmm. of nebraska i think i was just blown away mm -hmm. by that and so what's really important you know again i want to harp on this because i meet with a lot of practitioners and mm -hmm. that's how we met you know several mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. right is practitioners don't know this dr jones mm -hmm. if they're looking at two to 16 ratios that's it right they're not focusing on the four and if you had to give you know weight or put this in a hierarchy what's more dangerous the four or the two or the 16 like can you break oh, it down the four for sure the four, yeah, because you just you just have the much higher risk for DNA mutations, right? And then just, poof, yeah, yeah. The sixteen can cause issues. You know, the sixteen might cause estrogen dominant symptoms. It might cause more you know proliferative symptoms. But it's not. It's the four that I'm really worried about with cancer, mm -hmm. for sure, and or and even prostate cancer. You know, we forget about men, but men with high four OH four hydroxy that doesn't methylate very well, their risk for prostate cancer goes right up. Wow, mm -hmm. very important point right there. And again, if someone is doing serum testing, they're not, they're never gonna know. They're never gonna know. Nope, it's done in uh, urine testing. Right. Because we have to get it through the liver when it comes out through detox. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, and now what's the connection between methylation, glutathione, and the 4-hydroxy? Do you wanna kind of break that down? Sure, so um, once the estrogen goes through phase one, then it, it gets, becomes, let's say two, let's say it's the healthy one, the 2-hydroxy, and so then it has to go through phase two detox, and so, part of phase two detox for estrogen is methylation. And so then it becomes from two hydroxy, it becomes two methoxy. Um, and so when we're looking at testing, we want to make sure that they're methylating really well so that they are essentially sort of neutralizing the effects. They're, they're gonna clear it out. So before that four hydroxy can go around and do damage, um, it's getting rid of it and clearing it out through phase two. Big point. Big, so that's what's so helpful. And whereas glutathione, if somebody has healthy levels of glutathione, that kind of protects against everything and all damage, right. which is really, really great. But unfortunately, not many people have really healthy levels of glutathione. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating. So uh, I've read some research too on sulforaphane from the, the broccoli seed cruciferous vegetable mm -hmm. uh, phytonutrient and how it really upregulates quinone reductase, which is kind of the enzyme that will take that the 4-hydroxy back, you know, yeah. through that pathway. So mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting. And I know Dr. Lynch at the seminar talked about uh, dopamine quinones, and there's all these nasty quinones that are equally yeah. damaging. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, one to keep in mind for folks that are like, uh, I want to hear what you recommend, but that would be kind of my initial thoughts. But uh, if someone comes in, you know, to your clinic or your lab, and they have high levels of the 4-hydroxy, mm -hmm. you know, they're not metabolizing estrogen well, what are your recommendations? I'd have to say, like, my number one recommendation, which comes from the, um, the broccoli, kale, cauliflower family, is DIM. Mm -hmm. And so do the diendol methane. And I recommend that it comes from I3C, which is the big word is indole 3 carbonyl. Um, indole 3 carbonyl is um, high maintenance. It requires really good stomach acid to break apart. And once it breaks apart, one of the things it makes is dim. It makes some other stuff too. So, and then dim does the job. And so I always say, well, spend the extra dollar, take dim and, and you know what it's going to do. It's going to help you make more the healthier two hydroxy. Right. So just do dim. Right. Skip that. S yeah. Intermediate step. Why exactly. take the precursor? Exactly. That's fascinating. And then of course eat. <laughs> you know, cruciferous eat, eat vegetables. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Just eat real food. That's amazing. <laughs> so, Dr. Jones, before we go to final questions, and by the way, this has been amazing. Our listeners are going to dig this stuff. Fantastic. Uh, the Dutch test, do you want to kind of explain what that is and, and where folks can learn a little bit more about that and, and what it looks for? Yeah, absolutely. So, Dutch, believe it or not, we're not a Dutch company. It just stands for Dried Urine Testing for Comprehensive Hormones. And the website is Dutch Test. Dot com. It's very, very straightforward, but it's easy. It's instead of um, like saliva or instead of getting your blood drawn or instead of carrying a jug around for 24 hours, there are little sticks that people urinate on four times during the day. And so you still get the circadian rhythm, mm. but because it's a dried urine test, you also get all the metabolites we've talked about, the things like DHT, the metabolized and the free cortisol, cortisone, we test cortisone as well. And so you get a lot bigger picture and still, like I said, get that four rhythm through the day, morning, afternoon, before bed, what have you. That's awesome. Which is really nice. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, and so for the listeners that want to learn a little bit more about that, I'm sure your lab has expanded since 2012 when we interviewed Mark Newman. And yeah. he was one of the first, uh, I used to do the webinars for a company called Simongen, and so he, he was one of our first kind of series, if you will. So we mm -hmm. did a back-to-back -back series, and I'll put that uh, information about that, uh, the link below this video, so folks okay. can check that out if they're interested. Fantastic. So Dr. Jones, now we're going to get to know you a little bit better. <laughs> and, and, and our first Yay. question is, this is what we've asked 120 guests prior mm -hmm. to having you on the show, is what is your more morning routine you my, you, my morning routine is inspired by you so I get up in the morning and I have green tea and then I do 20 minutes of cardio and then um, I do fasted cardio and then Let's I Let's pause. What, oh, are you walking around? Or are you on the treadmill? I'm on a treadmill. Okay. So I'm on a treadmill at an incline and Sorry. I do it and I vary I keep I vary either the incline or the pace kind of depending what I remember to do and yeah. how good the song is that I'm listening to. Um, and then I do, I make more green tea and I have hot lemon water and I make a smoothie. And while my tea is steeping, I walk my dog. Nice, that's awesome. <laughs> that's my morning. Cool, right <laughs> yeah. on. That sounds really great. So if there was one herb, nutrient, or botanical that you just couldn't live without, you're stranded on a desert island, vitamin D, <laughs> vitamin D and omega-3s are covered, what would it be? You know, I'd have to say, not so much stranded desert, but like, the number one herb that I think really just helps women up, down, left, and right is chase tree berry, Vitex. Mm -hmm. It's great for the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian communication. Um, there's a lot of mixed research on what it does and how it affects LH and how it affects progesterone production. I, I've decided it's like a magic herb and it's smart. And I just tell people just take chase tree berry if indicated and it will just do its thing. It will know what to do. It's like an ovarian adaptogen. That's what I tell people. Nice. I love it. I use it for fertility. I use it for PMS. I use it for heavy periods. I use it for just overall hormonal blah in women who are still getting their period. If they're menopausal, it's not the herb for them, but right. chase tree is my go-to unicorn herb every time. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Now, frequently that's found with like black cohosh and all these different things. So do you it like it be. as a standalone? I like or? it as a standalone. Okay. And I do, I recommend women do it in the morning because the hypothalamus pituitary, if we talked about, is more active in the morning. Mm. That's when the train gets going and, you know, cortisol gets pumped out. And it's the same for hormones. And so, for the most part. And so I'm like, take it in the morning. Love Jump it. on that train and let's get you better. Get it going. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. No one's mentioned that before. I know. I was <laughs> <That's really laughs> thinking about it yesterday. Like... That's my favorite herb. I love it. It tastes terrible. Oh, it tastes horrible. I've decided it tastes so bad that the ovaries are like, okay, I promise I'll work. <laughs> I'll just do it. <laughs> just, just, I promise. Just keep it out of yes. here. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So yeah. if you were to bump shoulders, Dr. Jones, with President Barack Obama, or a future president, maybe someone from the World Health Organization, and turn to them, just have 30 seconds, 30 seconds to share with them a lifestyle or health tip. What would you tell them and why? You know, given that the whole conversation today is about the adrenals, you see on social media a lot about hustle. Have you been seeing that? Mm -hmm. Like, keep your hustle strong and it's all about the hustle and your hustle game. And I'm like, no, no, stop hustling. You're killing your adrenals. Don't hustle or hustle a little bit or hustle and relax. Hustle and take care of yourself, really, ultimately. You know, go on vacations and say no and set boundaries and sleep. Sleep well. Get off your phone. Yeah. Stop. You don't have to hustle all the time right. because then we have to pick up the pieces <laughs> on our end when we're doing the lab. <laughs> right. Oh, that's a great perspective. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it's funny on Instagram and Twitter, particularly those images where they're like yes. the memes and whatnot. Yes. The hustle thing has really taken off. And, and it really, I mean, I get it. It's popular and it, I know it's very, um, you know, cool to put it out there. And, and I, th I think a lot of people are truly, you know, living their passion and they're hustling and they're creating businesses and they're doing really great things. But then they're blowing out their adrenals and because they're not taking care of themselves and right. it's unfortunate to see as a healthcare practitioner. Yeah. So like hustle and balance, that's what I would say. <laughs> hustle and find balance. Do some hu hustle intervals. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's really hustle great. for a while then just stop. Right. Read a book. <laughs> Love it. So Dr. Jones, yes. if folks want to connect with you online and, and so forth, what's the best channel, maybe website? Uh, where can Absolutely. Folks um, it's www.dutchtest.com. Cool. Very straightforward. And uh, my information is there. The lab information is there. And people can definitely get a hold of us. Fantastic. Our tests are on there. We have a whole library of free videos. You don't have to be a healthcare practitioner to learn more about this. The videos are short. They're about 10 minutes a piece. And they explain adrenals, sex hormones, cortisol, cortisone, testosterone, you know, women's health. So go learn. Love it. Take it. 
Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. Really enjoyed yeah. this message and knowledge. And uh, folks, you can access the show notes if you're watching this on YouTube at highintensityhealth.com slash drjones. Well, that concludes this episode of High Intensity Health Radio. Thanks again for tuning in and thanks for subscribing and sharing a moment of your day with us. Really appreciate you coming on the show. And any feedback that you do have, you can type it in below the comment bar here on YouTube or over in iTunes. Just go to highintensityhealth.com slash iTunes. You can leave a very brief rating and review. That gives me feedback. That gives our guest speakers feedback feedback and allows other people to learn a little bit more about the show and what we do and how uh, we help improve the lives of others through promoting cutting edge health information. So hope you have a wonderful day and thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode.